Dr. Phil, I need your help in a big, big way. My family is in shambles. It's been worse than it's ever been, ever. I've disowned my mom, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Nikki, I can't stand, at, no, I can't stand her. I'll tell you why. Bam Margera, oh boy. It's not often that the person I talk about really needs no introduction. I'm pretty sure everyone knows who Bam is. He's gone from a professional skateboarder who's collaborated with the likes of Tony Hawk to a successful actor who starred in numerous movies and productions. He's 50% millionaire stuntman, 50% rock star entrepreneur. But most importantly, he's 100% having one of the most dramatic public breakdowns I've ever seen. I read one more idiot say, Bam, you need to get some help. No shit, Sherlock. That's just a tiny appetizer of what's to come, people. See, your average public meltdown nowadays usually lasts days to weeks. Maybe a month. Bam, on the other hand, has been a slow build over many, many years. And if I'm being honest with you, the contrast in his appearance because of it is kind of shocking. There's quite a visible decline over the years here. It's one thing to age, everyone does. But this is something completely different. He's like morphing into a drunken, slightly skinnier version of his father. It's been a hell of a ride for Bam. And we're going to cover it all. Well, most of it. See, because of the length and span of Bam's legacy, it's going to be damn near impossible to include every fact. Not to mention almost every one of Bam's close friends from the Jackass days are crazy enough to warrant their own video. So to keep this story streamlined, I'll be mentioning Bam's friends when they're relevant, but this is about him first and foremost. Now with that said, to really see the full extent of this meltdown, we get to start way back at the beginning, Bam's CKY days. Growing up, Bam was always interested in music, filmmaking, and skateboarding, and he was pretty skilled at all three areas. All the way back in 1997, Bam was starting to make a name for himself in skateboarding. He was 18 when he landed his first sponsorship deal with toy machines, and at this time he had a tight group of friends that he met during high school and from skating. In his spare time, they'd usually get together, do a lot of random stunts, and film their crazy antics. He was also a huge supporter of his older brother Jesse's band, Can't Kill Yourself, or CKY for short. That's also the name of Bam's series that he would produce. The CKY video series really started to come together when Bam was in graphic arts. The idea of film production really interested him. Bam and his friends would go out at lunchtime and on their breaks, and film stunts that they did with other classmates. And from this, the idea of their CKY video series was born. The videos featured Bam and his friends and family performing various stunts and pranks, and they broke it up with skating and music montages. The CKY videos was a huge start for a lot of these guys. Some notable names that participated in it were Bam and his family, Brandon Novak, Franz, and Ryan Dunn. That was just the beginning though. Once Bam's first CKY video started to circulate around, it developed a little bit of a cult following with people interested in extreme sports and things like that. One of the people that came across it was a man named Jeff Tremaine. He was the editor for a magazine called Big Brother, and he was also a pro BMX rider himself. He took notice of Bam's series and he saw potential. At this time, Jeff was working with Johnny Knoxville, who was a stunt writer at this time for MTV, and they were working together to produce some kind of reality TV show that was based around challenges and stunts. In early 2000s, Jeff got in contact with Bam and flew him and the CKY crew out to see their second video, which he was really impressed by. So impressed that he would actually decide to work with Bam on his upcoming project. They eventually settled on the concept of the Jackass TV show. The show itself was fairly entertaining, but only lasted three seasons. There were a few reasons why it ended. There was some controversy over people fearing it would encourage kids to recreate the pranks. The cast also felt like they weren't being paid properly by the network. MTV was also caving to criticism and started to refuse to re-air the episodes. But the nail in the head was when Bam and the CKY crew ended up leaving halfway through season 3. They thought about continuing on with the series, but facing increased censorship from network television, they eventually just dropped it. But that wasn't the end. The show must go on, just in a different way. So the cast and crew decided, since they didn't really have a chance to finish the TV show and give their fans a real uncensored finale, maybe they should take a different route. And in 2002, they had their full reunion in the form of the Jackass movie. One of the most memorable movies of my childhood. As stupid as it really is, the movie was a fairly big success worldwide. They had a $5 million budget and they made over $20 million in opening weekend. Not too shabby, especially when you consider the whole movie was basically just shock value, consisting of the group of guys just torturing each other. What? Bam, cock out, cock out. No, 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 no. Oh. 
Whether you hate it or love it, you gotta admit it's a classic. After the success of the Jackass movie, the cast broke off into different projects. Knoxville went on to do some acting, Bam signed on with MTV but in a different show, Viva La Bam, and a few others went off to produce Wild Boys and a few other spin-offs. By this time in Bam's life, he was doing a lot of drinking and partying. He was no longer just a name in skateboarding, he was now a mainstream celebrity. And he quickly had a drastic lifestyle change, mostly for the worst. When he started filming for Viva La Bam, Margera ended up getting caught in this weird situation where he was basically being paid to do wild and outrageous things. And it didn't matter what crazy shit they did, how drunk they were, they were getting paid to produce outrageous stuff. It was crazy, man. Our budget was like 300 grand to spend on each episode of just oh. fucking shit up. Yeah. Three, how do you how do you spend like 300 how do you, grand a week? How do you spend 300 grand fucking shit up? Can you? I, I the ideas that I would come up with were so bonkers that I would be like they're never going to approve of this and they would approve of it every time. <laughs> yeah, really? Like, uh let's get an elephant, you know, we, uh, there's one from Connecticut. It's 12 grand a day. We'll get that and then we'll build a castle moat in my front yard with a drawbridge and, and the only way to get on it. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and then we'll fly Compton ass Terry in. And, uh, and then uh, at the end, uh, I'll wreck eight of Don Vito's shitty cars, so he'll get so mad that he'll put a brick on the gas pedal of my Hummer and drive that off a 600-foot quarry cliff. Right, right, right. Greenlit. The show starred Bam's family and a couple of their close friends like Ryan, Rab, and Novak. They also had a ton of guest cameos. They would either set up some kind of elaborate set piece at Castle Bam or travel somewhere to perform various stunts. There was a loose storyline interwoven. But I'm pretty sure they just ended throwing that to the wayside when Bam's initial relationship ended and he ended up getting engaged to a close friend named Melissa after the series started. They did another spin-off called Bam's Unholy Union, which is basically what someone would call vlogging nowadays. It was like a nine part series that led up to Bam and Melissa's wedding. It mostly starred his family, minus Don Vito. So one of the more lesser known facts about Bam and his family is in regard to his uncle Don Vito, or Vincent Margera. He was a popular character in the early days of Viva La Bam, and he even had a cameo in the first two Jackass movies and other videos. Well, in 2006-2007, he kinda just disappeared off the scene. And uh, it's cause he got himself into quite a bit of shit. I gotta say this, I'm not trying to defame Bam's legacy or rip into his family, but this is kind of like a glossed over fact that people don't either know about or they don't talk about. I'm not really like that. I lay it all out. Plus it explains the mystery of what happened to one of the popular side characters. But with that said, in 2006, Bam's uncle Vito was arrested for fondling two young girls. He said he didn't, but he was convicted and found guilty of two counts of sexual assault on a minor. He was also ordered to stop portraying the Don Vito character and sentenced to 10 years probation. That's why some of the footage of him was cut out from later show releases. Sorry to all the Vito fans out there, but the dude's a degenerate. Another thing to note about this time in Bam's life is that sometime during the early Jackass days and the filming of Viva La Bam, Margera developed a pretty dangerous eating disorder associated with his drinking, which had evolved from hard partying into two to three day benders. So to deal with the massive amount of alcohol from the stunts and partying, Bam learned how to throw up on demand. At first, he only used it when he consumed alcohol and he didn't want to be sick after eating. Then it kind of shifted to him just throwing up all the time after drinking. Then it kind of shifted to him just throwing up after eating. I remember when we did an episode of Viva La Bam and Bam went and, and he had some pizza. It was about half a piece of pizza and he threw it up and Tony Hawk was there. He said, hey, Bam. You, I, I looked at Tony and Tony looked at me. Tony got a worrisome look in his face and he said, hey, Bam, you bulimic? <laughs> just like that. And Bam said, no, no, I just throw up whenever I eat. And Tony said, yeah, man, that's bulimia. You got to get help. Just like that. Bam shrugged it off. Yeah, there's some dark secrets during the Viva La Bam days. After the moderate success of the show, Bam continued to keep busy with various projects. He had Bam Radio on Sirius. He opened up a bar called The Note in his hometown, which is a terrible idea if you're drunk. But I guess with the amount of time Bam spends at bars, it only made sense to buy into one. And as you can imagine, his drinking got worse. He also had a serious coke problem that he didn't really want to address. Two of Bam's close friends, France and Novak, elaborated about it on a podcast. I've took a couple clips from their recent podcast related to Bam, but if you're interested, I'd recommend checking it out on their YouTube channel. Their podcast needs a couple updates like a video or something like that, but it's definitely worth checking out. France and Novak are actually really good together. It's shocking how far Novak has come, and it's kind of refreshing because he's got an honest perspective about his addiction. Either way, I'll link it in the comments. It's a good listen, and this part in particular gives you a good idea where Bam was on the partying scale. When we did Jackass 2, Bam was a, a full-blown uh, cocaine user on, on, a, on a daily basis, um, and 
you know, in his head, he said, when Jackass 2 is over, I will stop. I need this to be productive, which is a frightening place it's for for someone to be in their addiction and then again They're telling themselves they will they 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 have it marked on a calendar when they're going to yeah, stop yeah yeah you know they're, they're going to dictate the terms of how this thing is going to come to a head mm. uh, and the reality is is that you said it Franz it's an alcoholic's brain 101 it's always tomorrow all of Bam's drinking and drug use started to come to a boil in 2009 it was a brutal year for Bam, and really the first step in his decline, or fall from grace. It wasn't really a good year for Novak either. He may or may not have stolen Bam's $100,000 car during a heroin binge and landed himself in the clink. It was a bad time for these guys, and they were starting to include a lot of new, shady people in their personal life. People that only wanted to really use them. Like a good example of this is for a period of time, Bam kind of had like a live-in drug dealer. And one day he wanted some money, so he took Bam's ATV and sold it at the curb. Things of that nature. Bam didn't really care at all. Whether it be the coke or just fame gone to his head, he felt invincible. But in reality, he was a bit of a mess. And to see that, all you have to do is go back and watch Min Hags. During the filming of this movie, Bam was blasted daily. It got to the point where he doesn't even remember some of the scenes. Some were just made up on the spot because he was too blasted to even say his proper lines. There was constant infighting with the crew and cast, and at the end of the day, the movie sucked and it cost them over $600,000. All these issues weren't just affecting him at a professional level, they were seeping into his home life too. By July in 2009, his wife Melissa had basically had enough and dropped the separation card on him. Margera reacted in the most elegant of ways. He proceeded to have a four-day coke-fueled drinking binge, and then ended up with downing a bottle of pills. Luckily, he threw them up, but Missy still had enough and called 911. Bam was taken to the hospital for being severely dehydrated. His family and friends were obviously worried about him. So they got together and over a period of a few months, they planned an intervention. By the following December, they had Bam in a treatment center. I'm assuming the idea was to get him clean before Jackass 3D came out so he could try to salvage what's left of his career and get back on track. It could have worked too, but Bam quit rehab within days. And like it always does with shit snowballs, it just kept on rolling. Six months after rehab, Bam was attacked outside of his bar by some chick with a baseball bat. Apparently Bam was dropping the end bombs with security outside, and then some chick that was walking by got in an altercation with him. I believe she went home, came back, and then hit him with a bat. Or she got someone else too. Everyone denies their part in this, so I'm not sure. I do know Bam had to spend the night in a medical center though for his head injury. After that, a few months later in 2010, Jackass 3D released, and it did extremely good, broke box office records. But there wasn't really a lot of time for everyone to celebrate because unfortunately, tragedy just followed a few months later. The daredevil, an MTV star who was killed in a crash in Chester County, certainly fresh in the minds of family and friends. The coroner's report is out and says Don and his passenger, Zachary Hartwell, died from the impact and resulting fire of the crash in West Goshen Township early yesterday morning. Police have done an accident reconstruction and say Dunn's Porsche might have been traveling as fast as 130 miles per hour, 130, when it jumped a guardrail, flew into a ravine, and burst into flames. Ryan himself had a lot of personal and health issues he didn't often talk about. He had Lyme disease, which is linked to severe depression and anxiety. He would often have bouts where he would become very reclusive, and at one point, he even isolated himself from all of his old friends. He went for almost a year without talking to them. Dunn was also known for turning to the bottle quite often, and it's safe to say that probably played a part in his death. It's a shitty situation any way you look at it. If Bam's substance abuse and rockstar-esque lifestyle was the boiling point, this is when shit hit the kitchen fan. This was a huge turning point in Bam's life that obviously hit him pretty hard. It hit the whole fan base pretty hard. Ryan was there since the beginning, and he was a vital member of the original crew. If you were to ask Bam now, he'd say this is when his alcoholism took over. Which isn't quite true, Bam had dependency issues way before that. What this situation did do to Bam is drive him further down the self-destructive route he was taking and give him reasons to validate his drinking and coke use. A few months after Ryan's death, Bam took another blow when he came down with a minor leg injury. He had bone splints in his leg that required him to take some time off skateboarding. Having a shitload of free time, he took his drinking problem and turned it into full-blown binge drinking once again. He described at one point he was getting nearly all of his caloric intake from booze and soda. At this time, Bam was also spending a lot of time traveling to Iceland with his new fiance Nicole, his current wife. Back then, they were engaged and he was planning their wedding. During July 2013, Bam got arrested at an airport. 
Apparently the year earlier, he rented a car for five days, drove it like he stole it, and then dropped it off like nothing happened without paying for the damages. I don't know why any place would rent him a car at this point. After that he made another attempt at broadcast television in the form of BAM's badass game show. Probably the worst game show I've ever laughed at. It's your typical 2010 reality show revolving around people doing stupid shit with lots of forced laughter. BAM also looked like he was in an eternal hangover the entire time. It is, it, it is what it is. Once the show aired six episodes, Bam quickly went back to coke binging and drinking, with the occasional trip to Iceland. Uh, during one such trip, Bam had a slightly confusing incident happen with him in a rap group in Iceland. There's conflicting stories in regards to what happened, but with that said, during one of his many trips there, Bam was doing an appearance at a concert, and according to them, he was sexually harassing one of the female security guards and being a belligerent drunk who was trying to get backstage. As you can guess, he was making a scene. Conveniently, a rap group called the Icelandic Mafia, I'm not making this up, that's their actual name, noticed the commotion Bam was making, and they ended up jumping and beating the shit out of him in a lobby. Wait. Before you pass judgment, there's always two sides to a story, and according to Bam, none of that happened. And this is all because of his old publicist. But it's hard to tell what he's actually talking about, because he's about as high as Charlie Sheen during the last season of Two and a Half Men. None of this has anything to do with the Secret Solstice Festival, or any girls, or anybody yelling at anything. It has to do with Leon Hill working for Secret Solstice. I found this out two years ago. That motherfucker started a YouTube channel on me and a few other people. And his scam is, he tells all the people that he's working for that the other person is getting more hits and they got the money. So when we all got together and figured that out, that's how Leon Hill becomes a self-made millionaire. So when I said, Leon Hill, there's a, there's a Rolling Stone interview for you. I had my friend do it. And uh, he comes up <laughs> thinking it's a Rolling Stone interview just to find me. So him and his boys beat the fucking shit out of me. This is just the personal observation but at this point, Bam's starting to act really paranoid manic. Both common side effects of stimulant abuse. The Adderall's calling the shots now, boys. Well, it did for a bit. After this stunt, Bam once again tried to get clean. This time he lasted a bit longer than the first time, but still ended up leaving without finishing treatment. By 2016, Bam's family was really starting to get worried about him, and they were trying to take a more active role in getting him help. Bam and his mother went on a reality TV show called Family Therapy. I don't know why they thought this would work. But regardless, they talked to a doctor about Bam's self-destructive behavior, and it seemed for a while that Bam might actually improve and get on track. By the end of the year, Bam and his family had moved to Spain so he could focus on skateboarding again and clear his mind. It's hard to tell if Bam was actually clean during this time. He has a habit of downplaying his dependency issues. For about a year he laid low until he moved back to the states in 2017, and then some footage surfaced online of him skateboarding. Even though he was officially retired from the sport, he still wanted to be a part of the culture. And Bam's name still has value, nothing compared to what it once was, but he still has a following. In a somewhat last hurrah in skateboarding, he renewed his partnership with Element, and to celebrate the brand's 25th anniversary, they released 10 of Bam's best deck designs, as limited editions. 500 decks in total. Nothing huge, but definitely a start. Things looked like they were going to turn around for Bam, and people actually thought he might be able to pull it together. And the timing was perfect, because a month after the deck partnership with Element, Bam's son was born. It could have been the start of a new era. A kid's a good reason to turn your life around. But instead of getting his big boy pants on, he just grabbed himself a nice new DUI charge, less than a month after his son was born. Bam says he was sober for the six months after the DUI, all the way until the Columbia incident where he publicly relapsed, but I'm doubting that. And for the unaware, what I'm talking about is the time that Bam was in Columbia for holidays and was robbed at gunpoint. I just arrived in Cartagena alone and I took a taxi, a random one, from the airport to here and I couldn't speak Spanish, they couldn't speak English and they translated on their phone for me to read empty your wallet as they put a gun on their lap to show it to me. So I did and I had 500 bucks, they let me go. That was weird. Welcome to Colombia. <laughs> He used this as a reason to drink again, but I'm pretty sure Bam was never actually sober. I think it was just getting hard for him to keep up the act, and then he just used this as another excuse to grab the bottle. Even his friends are calling bullshit on this one. You see Bam get robbed in Columbia? I did, I saw it on his Instagram. 
And then I saw on TMZ, yeah. like uh, talking about him drinking again. Right. How's that make you feel? Well, I mean, it's sad, dude. Like I uh, kind of saw the signs, right? You know, I mean, it wasn't a surprise. And if anything would surprise me, it's that he only drank then. <laughs> Speaking of friends, it's important to note that there's an obvious rift occurring between Bam and his friends from the Jackass days. A lot of those guys found themselves in similar situations in the past. Steve-O went nuts and needed to be hospitalized for a while. Novak went to rehab like 14 times or something. It took him that long to beat his addiction. But he's been clean since 2015. They've all lived different lifestyles than they once did. And surprisingly enough, some of them have grown and matured because of it. Looking back on Novak, it blows my mind how far that guy's come. He went from being a straight street tweaker to working with rehab centers to get people clean. After the last few years of Bam shit, his remaining family and friends are getting tired of his games. So they all got together again and convinced him to admit himself into one of Novak's clinics that he was associated with. Bam was reluctant at first, but after having a little last hurrah, he ended up going January of this year. And like all the times before, he found a reason to leave. He posted this message on Instagram after the fact. There's 10 pages of this chicken scratch. Feel free to read it, but the TLDR is that he thinks he shouldn't be there because Novak is a liar and a scammer. And then he continues to rant about how he only drinks when he's bored and rehab is boring. It's, it's all just textbook denial and deflection. To me, this is where Bam's real issues come up. He wants to be in control and he's in complete denial. He thinks he knows what has to be done because he's seen the cycle with his friends before. But the only issue is he doesn't realize how far deep he himself is in that same cycle. Or he does realize it and just doesn't want to face it. It's hard to say. It very well could be a mixture of addiction and denial. One thing is clear though. He's not 100% honest with the extent of his drug use. Everything I've shown you has been mostly in regards to Bam's drinking and coke use. And Bam himself will only really admit to the drinking. But he's been doing a far bit more than he leads on. Novak and France let that one out of the bag. And he would, and he would tell you... You would see him drunk. You'd be like, dude, I'm just, all I do is sip beers. It's like, I'm looking at your eyes and I'm seeing you're doing a hell of a lot more than fucking drinking. Yeah. I can tell you're doing a lot more than sipping beers. You're doing a lot more than guzzling vodka. Now there's like serious Adderall in play, lots of sniffing of blow. And then somewhere along the line, he's picked up to like graduating to crystal meth, right? Like that's, uh, that's another icing on this cake is that he's in the meth these days. And no, and no one can talk sense into him. He's always right. And but God forbid anyone say that out loud because no, don't say that. Yeah. Fuck. I believe that's partially the reason why we're at today is because everyone wants to sweep this under the rug. That's a lot of stimulants, guys. Like, I mean, screw your brains up levels of stimulants. The Coke and booze isn't too surprising, but when you start mixing that with Adderall and meth, that's going to get you into some dangerous territory. I bet it's not uncommon for Bam to go four to five days without sleep. And then at that point, the only way for him to pass out at night is to drink himself to sleep. For real, it wouldn't surprise me at this point. And when you think it can't get worse, it actually does. Because over the last five months, Bam has taken his borderline junkie behavior to the next level. How do I explain what this is? So, for the ill-informed, Bam's psychosis is so bad at this point, he thinks he's solved black holes and wants to talk to Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm not kidding. According to Bam, he's created some language that I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of that's a mixture between Alaskan and uh, finger painting. I don't know, I'm not 100% sure, but Bam's on a whole new level with this shit. So C is everything of the alphabet between Lasky and Strigoi and English. C is everything. So what's beyond that? B. So B is B, the B before cause. So cause is a D. And then E. And then F. Why? Because I made it that way. You can learn all about it on his Instagram account, where he's been posting some pretty crazy stuff. Some of the classics include him ranting about his wife and how Novak is no more fun now that he's sober. My best friend, Brandon Novak, life partner. Um, I don't not want anything to do with him ever since he got sober. He's been four years sober and uh, congratulations. But all he does, if he's not on the phone talking about sobriety, he's texting while he's talking about sobriety. So if you're like, hey, uh, Novak, what's your favorite color? You'll be texting. It's, uh, it's, uh, one second. 
hit that. I can't take that. So I just stopped talking to him whatsoever. I couldn't take it anymore. And um, because I sip on beers or whatever, he says to me, I can't sit here and watch you kill yourself on Coors' lights and Adderall. I'm like, are you the same Brandon Novak that I have not bailed out not once, not twice, not three times, but 30 times of overdoses, you mother... It seems all of BAM's previous meltdowns were just a precursor to 2019. Like, you know it's bad when it goes from funny to sad, but then somehow it kind of goes back to funny again. That's BAM over the last few months. It's been a wild ride. So because BAM's not really in any shape to really do any actual jobs or produce something, he's been falling back on paid guest appearances to ensure the fact that he doesn't go broke and stays in the public spotlight. BAM's made a lot of money, but that doesn't last when you have a coke and meth problem and you're throwing parties like this. There's also another issue too though. See, having a coke and meth problem kind of makes it hard for you to make appearances and function like an adult. Like an hour, we told you that. We came early because you said to come early. Where is everybody? There's 50 people sold tonight. Yeah. Take me home. All right, we'll go home. Now! Get my reins over and take me home. So I'll give you a little context here. March of this year, good old Bam was scheduled to appear at West Side Comedy Club in New York. He arrived early to the venue after fighting with his wife, just to get into a screaming match with his manager. It was a bad day for Bam. He even blew off Anthony Cumia earlier that day. No loss there. It's not apparent what exactly happened with Bam and Nikki during the day, but Bam was freaking out and posted two videos on Instagram ranting about his wife before the concert. My wife left me and she went back with my Range Rover. Fuck that shit. If I don't see her, at the show, I'm canceling it, and she better be in a new outfit because she always wears the same fucking thing, or else I'll break shit. The fucking street hoe took all my credit cards and went back home, and now I'm at the Soho Grand, and I can't check in because she took all my credit cards. I better see you in one hour and 24 minutes, Nikki. And then he had his fist to cuffs with the manager leading up to the two sets being cancelled at the comedy show. Later on that night though, there was also one more video Bam put out that was only up shortly. And for the life of me I can't find it anywhere. But I'm pretty sure it was just Bam ranting in his car at Nikki. And I think the windshield might have been smashed or something. Maybe he broke it, I can't say 100%. But I can say he was being a complete jackass. No pun intended. Because of the clear manic state he's been in over the last few months, his family and remaining friends once again came together and got Bam committed to a mental health facility for treatment. You're in my realm and you're not obeying my rules. It's okay to not obey my rules, but to come into my realm and not obey my rules? That could drive one insane. I'm sure. So, Nikki, get the fuck away from me. You were my mom are the only two that can make me go insane. And you must love it because I'm going insane. And if you come back again, I go insane. They'll probably come back. Tonight? I don't know, but if they do, I go insane. I'm fine when they're not here. And when they talk about them, I get a little, uh, whatever, loud. But once again, he signed himself out after a week and then went right back into the same behavior. Tweaked out skateboarding by day, binge drinking by night, and still hanging out with, uh, sketchy people. I don't want to be judgmental here, but that place kind of gives me crackhead vibes and it has nothing to do with the chick. Okay, maybe a little to do with the chick, but it's mostly about the air conditioner and the brown walls. It just screams trap house. It's all kind of disappointing and slightly confusing when you take into account how hot Bam's wife is. Jesus Christ, Bam. But what are you doing, man? I will admit though, he's been consistent with one thing over the last little while, posting his spirals for everyone to see. Uh, I have to do a Comic Con, but first I have to see my therapist. She's meeting me at the airport, flying in from Eureka, California. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Bam's addicted to the spotlight almost as much as meth. 
Which leads us to this month. Bam's basically lost it. On August 3rd, he got kicked out of an airport for being belligerent and possibly drunk. Luckily for us, he happened to record it, and I think he thought it was funny, but it's actually kind of sad. Okay. I had one drink. You also have an integrity issue, yeah. because there's a minute ago you said you had 50. Because I'm fucking with you, you idiot. Okay. What are you, a fucking moron? Do you think anybody can do 50 shots of tequila? Listen. Your word, you got man. out of your goddamn yeah. mind. That's your word, my brother. At least he didn't get arrested. The next day, Bam went on another Instagram tirade, pleading Dr. Phil to help him fix his family. He also manages to throw a little shade at his wife, mother, and Novak, of course. Dr. Phil, I've seen 28 doctors. I've been to four rehabs. When I went to my last rehab, they put me on more medication than I was on when I was out. When I'm out, I have Adderall and then some weird shit. I'll tell you all about it. I, I don't know what works and what doesn't. And occasionally, I'll have some beers usually. You know, like two, three. And, it, and it's not even every night these days. Not, not even now. Surprisingly enough, the Dr. Phil producers actually set up a meeting. But it had stipulations. There was to be no audience. And it was just Dr. Phil and Bam in a green room. And after the meeting happened on the following Monday, Bam agreed to go to a 60 to 90 day treatment center. There's one tiny detail that catches my eye in this article. It says that Bam's mom and wife asked Dr. Phil to help them identify what Bam was taking. That kind of reinforces what I was talking about earlier. If Bam's not honest with the extent of his drug use, no one is going to be able to help him. Not even Filthy Phil himself can save Bam if he won't own up. Once Bam finally agreed to go to treatment, he was flown out to the center. It was a beautiful center, lots of flowers, trees. He got clean, fixed things with his wife. He lived happily ever after. Or not. See, he only lasted a week and then quit again. And then he immediately proceeded to get shit-faced and then ended up getting arrested in the hotel lobby when they wouldn't rent him a room. This is embarrassing. Not for me, for you. I'm not trying to do anything that's gonna work. Trust me, I have my entire division coming to assist It doesn't you get work what you're trained to say and please. I'm, I'm not trained to say anything. This is just well, it doesn't work. I want my phone. So if you get it, I leave. If you don't get it, I keep doing this. Yeah, he was charged with trespassing. He's got uh, court in September. It's a good thing his parents care about him and he's somewhat famous. After this stunt, Bam's mother was once again able to get him back into treatment for the umpteenth time. Who the hell knows how long he's going to be in there for? By the time you guys see this video, he might have quit and solved the black hole mystery with Neil deGrasse. Bam moves fast. Part of me thinks this all might just be a last ditch publicity stunt from a desperate addict who has no intention of actually addressing his issues. Which is sad to say, because if you strip away the junky behavior and the ice voodoo alphabet, Bam seems like a cool dude. He's more than generous with his friends. He had a decent work ethic. He's still a talented skater. He's just a sloppy, grotesque shadow of what he once was. And for the people around him, the hard truth is, is that there isn't really anything they can do. Bam's family can't do anything. His friends can't make him get clean. Recovery is 100% up to him. It also seems in Bam's case, he wants to dictate his own recovery. He wants to be in control. And he wants to be all flashy, be on Dr. Phil in front of millions, have a bunch of deals lined up for himself afterwards and get right back on the grind. But in reality, he needs the complete opposite. He needs to realize he can't control his own recovery because he's his own worst enemy. He's not going to be able to jump and get back into his life and just continue like he thinks. And that level of self-awareness is damn near impossible to achieve when you're slamming Adderall and drinking yourself to sleep every night. If he ever does get clean and get his life on track, I think the best bet for him would be to open up a non-profit skateboarding school or something like that. I'm pretty sure even now Bam doesn't have to worry about money if he's smart. His issues is going to be filling his time with productive activities, not things that he used to do when he was all wasted. Those are going to be relapse triggers. Meaning he's probably going to have to avoid all social media and publicity for a while, take a huge step back and reassess some priorities. Most likely he's going to have to evict his drug dealer too. That's a, that's a for sure. I do have to give Bam one thing though. Through all this drunken chaos and insane delusions, the man still manages to do a goddamn good cameo. UK, it's Bam Margera, and I'm going to wish you happy birthday now because uh, you're not going to like this message. It sounds like it's an ex trying to fuck your day up. But the message is, your cum guzzling gutter slut you call a girlfriend uh, is telling you white lies. The homo thug BFF that you're cool with her hanging around with, you might as well shorten his name to thug because he's not a homo. They were Frenching in your car today outside of the gym 
and BFF should stand for best friends fucking because uh, she never even went into the gym. She was too busy bobbing up and down on Ace Hood's gym dog. I think you need to start doing some research. Hire a private investigator, cheaters. I don't know, but um, I hope you have a good birthday. Rock and roll.